Um, we're talking about Wilson's. Uh, we're talking about Wilson's constituents, and I want to begin by talking a little bit about the background of the text, why it's in the why it's in the force, how we, how we came to it. Um, we are in, as you know from your uh, from your CTI 100 professor. Uh, there are sections of the of the course that that uh, we try to explain. One of those is. Uh, Western individualism and, and science, which is where we began. And so uh, we've always taught Mill, and uh, we had a number of uh, different texts that we tried to use for science that we experimented with, and not always uh, quite so effectively or, or happily. Um, at one time, we read Ernest Mayer's treatment of Darwin, Darwinian evolution. Um, we've had uh, professors who have used uh, uh, Francis Bacon. Uh, we even taught at one point uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. But some years back, uh, um, a couple of us had come across an article in the Atlantic Monthly by E.O. Wilson, and it was, a, it was a, an edited version of the chapter Ethics and Religion, and found it very compelling. Uh, we decided that this text was especially appropriate for what we're trying to do in CTI 100 uh, because it gives us a, a sense of a, a scientific worldview uh, from the point of view of a working scientist. Uh, he historicizes uh, scientific methodology, as, as you know from having read chapter 3. Uh, he gives a pretty clear uh, uh, explanation of what we mean by scientific methodology in, in chapter four. And then in his genetic cultural coevolution uh, chapter, and then ultimately in ethics and religion, he describes the ways that this worldview is, is particularly important for understanding our relationship with the world and our relationship uh, with, with each other. And, uh, and, and that's what we're, we're trying to do. So let's begin uh, with, with chapter one. And in chapter one, I find this uh, an important chapter because he, he tells his own story. Uh, when he went to school at the University of Alabama, uh, how he was interested in, in science, how he was interested in science because he liked to, to traipse around in the woods. But when he got to Alabama, he realized that he actually knew, knew very little about it and, and read Mayer's text. And from that, it began to, his worldview began to, to change. Part of that personal story that he tells is um, that of his own uh, background in the Southern Baptist tradition. Uh, I think the language here is, is important. Uh, you recall in, in uh, chapter one, he says that. Um, he says, I've been raised a Southern Baptist, laid backward under the water on the sturdy arm of a pastor, been born again. I knew the healing power of redemption. Faith, hope, and charity were in my bones. And with millions of others, I knew that my Savior, Jesus Christ, would grant me eternal life. More pious than the average teenager, I read the Bible cover to cover twice. And, and this, rhetorically this is important because he's demonstrating to us that uh, the tradition that he's going to ultimately reject, that of uh, um, Southern Baptism, uh, the Southern Baptist uh, tradition, and reject it primarily because it doesn't allow for, for evolution. He's, he's doing so on the basis of, of uh, having uh, of a, an informed basis. He knows what it is that he's rejecting is not something that he's putting aside because he's unfamiliar with it. He's he's quite familiar with it. I think also just the metaphor that he uses that it was in his very bones is important. When we read it here at this first point in, in the text, it just sounds to us like the conventional metaphor that is something you know so well, but it's in the very bones. We know that it'll be a metaphor that's much more rich later, uh, especially when it moves into ethics and, and religion. Uh, because that religious impulse itself is part of the, the epigenetic rules that, that we have inherited. Uh, also important in this beginning is that he suggests that he, he still, even as he's rejecting the Southern Baptist tradition, he still acknowledges the, the benefits of the religious impulse that, that it, it provides, as he says, 
um, uh, the notion of being part of a tribe, that, that he understands that people have to have a larger purpose for themselves, and that we need to, to have a story to tell. Uh, and that story will make clear to us that we're more than just animated dust. And at that stage, he, he, he moves on to, to really get at the thesis of, of the text, which is that uh, the, the story of science, uh, the story of evolution, can perhaps be that writ, like holy writ, uh, written anew, and that it can serve that purpose that, uh, that scripture and that traditional religion has traditionally, has traditionally served. He ends the chapter uh, by invoking the myth of Icarus, whose uh, wax wings were fashioned by his father, Daedalus, and, and uh, he, of course, flies too close to the sun, and, and his wings melt, and he plunges into the sea. And he sets that up, really, as, as a, a, a story, uh, a myth that we can read in one of two ways. We can read it either as a cautionary tale, uh, and of course the analogy to scientific endeavor and intellectual pursuits are, are, are clear here, I think. Uh, we can read it as a cautionary tale, that is, don't try too much, don't fly too high, don't, don't pursue uh, too far, or there's great danger in it. Or, uh, or we can read it as an inspirational tale, which is what he really wants us to do, and that is uh, to, to go ahead and go as far as we can to pursue it you know, in the way that Neil had suggested uh, that we pursue questions to their ends without fear, uh, that we do that, and even if we fail, that it becomes a, a splendid a splendid failure. So with chapter one, he sets up uh, really his own background, sets up what he's going to try to do, and, and then begins to do it in <coughs> chapter two. And in chapter two, uh, the Ionian enchantment um, or excuse me, uh, in chapter two, the, the great branches of learning, um, he defines for us consilience. And, and by consilience, he means the jumping together of knowledge by the linking of facts and fact-based theory across the disciplines. And it's that sense of the merging of the disciplines, that interdisciplinary nature of his endeavor uh, that becomes also important for his later arguments. Um, he laments the fragmentation of knowledge, particularly in the academy. Uh, he notes that uh, the number of majors uh, has increased in most universities while the number of required general education courses has decreased. And, and what that means is that students and graduates of those institutions have less shared language and less shared understanding of the world, and that they become, as a result of that, less able to solve problems, solve real problems, because they're approaching those problems uh, in, in a kind of limited and narrow fashion, determined only uh, by, their, by their disciplines. He's going to want to move past that. He's going to want to suggest that, the, that uh, there can be a kind of conciliant relationship between ways of knowing, and in fact what he calls the, the two primary ways are that of the humanities and the sciences. While it would seem, because he's a scientist, that he's privileging the sciences, and in fact he is, he'll, he'll make clear as we get a little further into the text, uh, the, role of, the role of the humanities. Next, in chapter three, uh, he gives us the, uh, the story of the enlightenment. 